aircraft finishes come in hundreds of colors and hundreds of styles. An aircraft finish can look not only beautiful, but it can actually affect the shape as perceived by man. It can create a look that is faster, sleeker, tougher, meaner. A paint scheme can be used to hide it or find it. But looks aren't everything. The painted finish has another function, which is to provide a lightweight protective covering over the highly reactive materials airplanes are made of, such as fabrics, composites, and aluminum. Years ago, when labor was cheaper and the air was less polluted, many aircraft glistened in their highly polished aluminum skins. Today, they are generally protected with a glossy skin of polyurethane, enamel, or acrylic that gives them a smooth and shiny appearance while protecting them from today's pollution. A visit to just about any general aviation field will usually show you the following conditions. Fading, peeling, checking, tearing, and leaking. With a lack of proper maintenance, Mother Nature and pollution take their toll. We will be taking you to one of the most notable and affordable paint shops in the Midwest, Central Aviation Incorporated. Central is located at the Watertown Municipal Airport in Wisconsin, between Madison and Milwaukee. Randy Effinger and Sandy Schumacher and their crew will be tackling this Beechcraft T-34. Hundreds of aircraft have come out of those hangar doors over the years, including most of what you see here on the ramp with me today. While watching this video, keep in mind there are several ways to strip and paint an aircraft and several types of finishes to choose from. Always follow the safety procedures printed clearly on the strippers and paints. Don't take chances. Now let's get started. The aircraft used in this video will be a Beechcraft T-34. The owner has replaced several parts on the aircraft, including wing panels, ailerons, and wingtips, and he also wishes to update to a more modern paint scheme. All control surfaces are removed so stripping can be accomplished easier and more effectively. The inside trailing edges of the wings and tail surface must also be stripped. Great care is given in saving all hardware, nuts, bolts, and screws, and that all parts are properly labeled. The control surfaces are placed on sawhorses for stripping. Often, several tough layers of paint on the controls make the job difficult. The wing tips are removed and will be stripped with other small parts. Note that the lamp and the clear lamp cover are removed. The carburetor air intake grill and filter are also removed. Cleaning the canopy edges is accomplished with solvent before taping. Two layers of masking tape are carefully applied to the edges. Corners and radius are later trimmed with a razor knife. The paper being applied is a one-sided plastic coated paper, more commonly known as freezer paper. It is folded in half with the coated sides facing each other, and again, taped in place with two layers of masking tape. The plastic coated paper holds up longer and also repels water and chemicals. Put the two plastic sides together and always keep the plastic side off the canopy. Static electricity can cause paint to be attracted under the paper and cause excess bleeding. Great care must be taken to make sure none of the stripper contacts the plexiglass canopy which would result in permanent damage to the canopy. This thermometer probe is also masked off. 
The prop is masked next. The spinner is also masked off or can be removed. Once again, two layers of masking tape and folded plastic coated paper with the coated sides together are applied. Make certain the stripper does not enter the prop hub assembly area. All antennas should be covered with paper. Due to the large gaps in this particular canopy, a second sheet of paper was installed to protect the interior from stripper damage. The landing gear is covered, and in most cases, the wheel well area is taped off. On this airplane, however, the wheel wells will be repainted. The engine is covered with paper to protect it from stripper and overspray. Any antennas or other non-painted parts underneath the aircraft must be covered. The nose gear and wheel are covered along with the landing light. With all parts taped and masked off, we are now ready for part two, stripping. The top half of the T-34 will be stripped beginning around the masked off areas. A large brush and a coffee can is used to apply the stripper. If stripper comes in contact with the paper, wipe it off immediately. No prepared remover should be used on aircraft fabric or be allowed to come in contact with any fiberglass reinforced or plastic parts such as ray domes, radio antennas, wheel pants, wing fairings, or wing tips. The active agents will attack and soften the binder or even melt these parts. Starting high on the dorsal fin, a thin even coat of stripper is applied. The stripper is drawn directly from a 55 gallon drum by an industrial paint pump. Compressed air is used to drive the pump. Anytime you work with the paint stripper, always wear protective goggles and rubber gloves. If any stripper comes in contact with your skin or clothing, wash it off immediately with water. This enamel paint is removed rather easily with this methylene chloride base stripper. Acrylic lacquers and other types of paint may require different strippers. Check with a paint shop or test several strippers for the best acting type. Never use an acid-based stripper on any aircraft or aircraft part. Excess stripper is washed away, which makes walking much easier. The stripper is extremely slippery. Using aluminum wool or a wire brush, the paint is removed. Don't concentrate on removing all of the paint on the first stripping. A second or even third coat can be applied. The control surfaces are covered with generous layers of stripper using a brush. Over the years, older aircraft may have accumulated many layers of paint buildup on the control surfaces. Remember that the surface must be dry for the stripper to work effectively. Try not to let the stripper and bubbled paint dry completely because it will adhere back onto the aircraft. Don't let water come in contact with the aircraft until all stripping is completed. Water will stop the chemical reaction of the stripper. After a few minutes, the control surfaces are ready for wire brushing. The leading edge of this wing and the aileron are Beechcraft replacement parts. They are covered with a very tough zinc chromate epoxy. Plenty of good old elbow grease is required. A second layer of stripper is applied to tough areas and let work. The flat black paint on the back side of the prop is removed. If decals such as this one are covered with plastic, a hot air gun can be used to remove the covering. Stripper will not penetrate the plastic film.
A thin second coat of stripper can be sprayed on large areas for tough paint. After most paint has been stripped, all surfaces are rubbed with aluminum wool and washed with water. This procedure catches a lot of small paint specks and the water stops the stripper action. Now I bet you thought the messy part was over. Wrong. Underneath the aircraft, a first heavy coat of stripper is applied. To avoid stripper dripping on you, start from the lowest point and work up. Give the stripper sufficient time to work at the paint. Remember, let it do the work for you. The next morning, Stubborn Paint receives a second coat of stripper and brushing. The trailing edges also require a second coat. These magnesium coated control surfaces generally require a lot of hand rubbing. Use plenty of water to neutralize the stripper on your last pass. The paper on the canopy is removed and the individual canopy pieces are removed and masked off. Also, mask off the cockpit. Here the second coat of stripper is applied to the tail cone and wing tips. Once all the paint is loose, a pressure hose can be used to clean up the part. The same procedure is followed on the last remaining aircraft parts. Stripper is carefully brushed around and on the canopy. After a few minutes, paint can be rubbed or scraped off. All paint is now stripped and the aircraft is ready for part three, scratching and solvent wash. Scratching of the aircraft is accomplished with aluminum wool. Roughing up the surface will help the zinc chromate primer stick to the aluminum. Make sure all rivet heads and all metal seams are cleaned. This is the last chance to remove any remaining paint. Wipe down the area with a clean rag soaked in paint thinner. Use a wire brush on any tough to get at areas such as this cowl latch. The control surfaces and canopy are also scraped and wiped down. The solvent wash is the next step in the painting process. But first, all surfaces must be covered. This includes exhaust static holes, static plates, antennas, landing gear if paper was removed during stripping, and the narrow rubber seal along the wing route. The solvent wash being used is called Prepsol, a DuPont product. It is applied with a clean cloth and wiped dry with a second cloth. This removes any remaining oil or film on the aircraft. If all oil and film is not removed, 
the etching acid will not penetrate. The inside trailing edge must also be wiped down. Continue wiping down the aircraft and don't forget the bottom of the plane as well. After the entire aircraft, canopy and parts are wiped down, the plane is ready for step four, etching. The next step is to etch the entire surface of the aircraft. The etch used is a DuPont metal conditioner. Four one-gallon jugs are prepared by diluting the etch with water. Follow the directions with the product. Etching is often referred to as an acid wash. Remember, that is your goal. Spray and cover the surface heavily and evenly. You cannot use too much, but don't waste it. Generally, working from the bottom up, spray the aircraft and let it soak for five minutes. If possible, the etch should be sprayed on a dry surface. Do not let the solvent dry on the surface. The aircraft is hosed off with plenty of water, removing all etching acid. Pay special attention to seams so they are clean. The upper and lower wing surfaces are sprayed next. The trailing edge is also carefully sprayed. Note, the magnesium coated flaps are not sprayed with this particular etch. The wing is then washed down with plenty of water. Make sure all etch is removed from the aircraft. DuPont's 226S conversion coating is now sprayed on the magnesium control surfaces. This etch is a light green in color and is applied in the same manner. Make certain to wear a properly approved respirator when spraying the etch. Once again, remove all the etch with plenty of water. After the aircraft is thoroughly dry, it is ready for part five, zinc chromating. DuPont Zinc Chromate 2085S is thinned one to three or one to four depending on the spray gun with DuPont thinner 3812S. Priming begins on the bottom side of the aircraft. Apply a thin, even coat of primer. Safety note, an approved respirator must be worn at all times when spraying the zinc chromate. Gene, a 12-year veteran of aircraft painting, is wearing a full face mask covering mouth, nose, and eyes. He has a separate airline with the compressor supplying fresh air from outside the building. A well-fitted double cartridge organic vapor respirator approved for painting with fresh cartridges can also be used. All body parts, including hands, should be covered. Don't skimp on safety.
The top side of the wing is painted next with a thin and even coating. Make sure no runs occur in the chromate phase because they would have to be sanded off and resprayed. side of the prop and nose bowl are sprayed. Can you tell Gene has done this before? continues aft on the aircraft until all parts are covered. Zinc chromate is a very popular primer because of its corrosion resistant qualities. Zinc chromate is held in an alkaline resin. This does not produce an absolutely tight surface but allows a small amount of water to enter the film and free some of the chromate ions, preventing or inhibiting the formation of corrosion on the surface it protects. It should not be used as a primer for acrylic lacquers, as the solvents in the acrylic will lift the zinc chromate from the surface. Once the chromate has dried, we are ready for part six, filling and sanding. Filling of small dents is done by applying a thin coat of body putty to the area. As shown here, Chromate Light, a USC product, is being mixed with a supplied hardener. The putty should be a lightweight type. Use a plastic wedge to apply the putty. Be careful of excess around rivet heads and seams. Hail damage is quite visible on the aircraft when sprayed with a flat primer. The aft and port fuselage was damaged and resulted in several dozen dents. The nose bowl, which was damaged in a bad landing, required a lot of attention and putty. Let the putty dry for the required time before sanding. Make certain to check the underside of the aircraft, especially wingtips and tail sections where hangar rash often occurs. Here is a better look at the nose cowl and bowl area. Much time will be needed to repair the area. One option is to replace the parts. Sanding is accomplished with an orbital sander starting off with 80 grit paper. The sander molds well to the different radiuses of the cowl. Make sure to feather out the putty at the edges so there is no visible buildup. A mask is worn to keep dust out. The hail dents are also sanded. The thinner the putty is applied, the less sanding is required. Don't sand the rivets. It doesn't take long to wear off a head. Hail damage and other small dents were found on the port wing. Once the sanding is finished, the plane is blown off with compressed air and the sanded areas receive a second coat of zinc chromate.
After the chromate dries, the putty areas receive the first of three coats of gray primer, or sanding base. The primer fills in small depressions and scratches. The first application is actually two coats of paint. Apply the primer somewhat heavily, but avoid sags or runs. Any plastic or fiberglass parts are primed with this gray sanding base. Once the primer has dried, the areas are wet sanded with 240 grit sandpaper. The gray areas are then wiped down with a tack cloth. The same procedure is then repeated for the second coat. Note, Jean is now wearing a double cartridge organic vapor respirator and not a full mask. The second coat is sanded using 400 grit paper. On the third and final coat, a primer sealer is applied and let dry. If a sealer is not applied, down the line the body filler can be seen resulting in ugly spots. No sanding takes place on this coat. The airplane is now ready to receive its base color, which is part seven of this video. As you can see, repainting an aircraft can be a lot of work. Before we spray on the base coat, let's spend some time on the spray gun and some spray techniques. We recommend that you carefully read the manual supplied with your spray gun for specifications and tips. This is the trigger air valve, which activates the gun. This is the fluid adjustment valve, which controls the flow of paint through the gun. And this is the wing port valve. Now, let's take a look at the nozzle. The fluid needle is in the center, that's where the paint flows through. These four holes surrounding it are the atomizing air holes. They atomize the paint. Here and here are the wing port holes. They control the pattern of the spray fan, either horizontal or vertical. Tipping can cause spitting because of low fluid in the paint cup. The best spraying technique is to be about six to 10 inches away from the surface. Don't angle up and don't angle down and don't use your wrists to paint. The best way is to move parallel along the surface. Make sure that a pressure recommended by the gun and paint manufacturer is used, and this should be determined with the air gun trigger open. A pressure that is too low can cause sags and runs. A pressure that is too high creates large mist particles that dry too fast and leave us with a rough finish. The owner of the T-34 wanted the gear and gear bays painted so Gene starts the procedure in that area. Gene says these low-wing aircraft can be tough, but the dollies are a big help. Thank goodness for a high-wing aircraft. The control surfaces are also sprayed with the base coat. DuPont's Imron, which is a polyurethane enamel, is used. Note that Gene is back to wearing his full mask with the outside air source. 
A final wet sanding using 400 grit paper is the next step. Overspray near gray primer areas is the main concern. Tack the entire aircraft with a tack cloth next. The gear and landing wheel are covered and the final wipe down of the aircraft is being accomplished. Starting on the bottom side, the aircraft receives the first of two white base coats. The paint is being pushed to the gun from a pressure pot. This makes the gun somewhat lighter, but more importantly, you don't need to stop and refill. Gene works on the top side of the wing next. then starts down the fuselage. Make sure to move the gun parallel to the surface and work from a 6 to 10 inch distance. The tail cone and other small accessories are next. After proper drying time, usually determined by room temperature and humidity, the aircraft receives a second coat. This one should be perfect. All the stripping, filling, priming, and sanding comes down to this coat. Note the nose is not sprayed because the top half will be painted flat black and the bottom orange. Once the paint is dried thoroughly, the aircraft is ready for part eight, taping and masking. This is a drawing from Beechcraft of a current U.S. Navy T-34 Model C paint scheme. The owner wishes to follow this scheme and the crew will get their measurements from it. The nose is masked off for the flat black areas. Note the same plastic coated paper is used. Immediately behind the canopy is another area that will be painted black. Dennis is measuring the distance from the wingtip and a strip of masking tape is applied. This line will mask off an area to be sprayed international orange. A stars and bars stencil is placed on the wing and distances checked with those on the Beechcraft drawing. It is secured in place and points marked. Masking tape is applied from point to point. The tips are trimmed with the scissors keeping the outside edge of the tape straight. The inside remains white. Do not use a knife as it will mark up the white surface. Oh, no. 
The masking for the bars is next. The tape is applied straight and parallel. The end strips are placed on next. After both sides are laid out, the end strips are cut and marked. Remember, it is the outside of the tape edge that is important. Notice how the tape is cut back at angles. The remaining points on the star are next. The radius of the circle is laid out and masked off. It will be the inside edge. The outside edge is marked and a large compass is used to find the radius. The outside tape is then applied. The same procedure is followed on the side of the fuselage. Gene is continuing his work on masking off the fuselage. Notice that white coated paper is placed near spray areas and brown conventional paper is placed in non-immediate overspray areas. The center of the stars are traced and cut out of coated paper. They are then secured in place with plenty of tape. The inside star area will remain white. The same technique used to lay out and mask the stars and bars is also used on any letters, patterns, and stripes. Gene begins a wet sanding with 400 or 600 grit paper to rough up the areas to be sprayed and wipes them down with a clean tack cloth. Dennis rubs all tape joints with a fingernail or other stiff object to make sure there will be no paint leakage or feathered edge. In the front half of the hangar, Dennis demonstrates the layout of a standard 12-inch end number on this Citabria. Place a strip of masking tape where the bottom of the number should be laid out. Measure up 12 inches and place a long strip of parallel tape. This will designate the top of the letters.
square off the left edge using a square. Central Aviation uses this flexible plastic straight edge which is two inches wide as a gauge in the layout. The width of all the letters will be the same except for the number one which is just two inches wide. A two inch space is left between each letter. The end number of the Citabria is 68551. Remember to use a good quality masking tape. Half inch 3M tape is being used here. The gauge is used to determine the angles of the letters. Two inches is measured up and in, and a line is drawn at a 45 degree angle. These letters will be covered, and the entire area will be sprayed red. The letters will remain white. In other words, they are reversed in. Remember, in this case, it is the outside edge of the tape that is important. The points of the masking tape are again cut at a 45 degree angle. To achieve a fine, clean line or edge using masking tape, press the edge down using your fingernail. Special attention should be used on all tape overlaps. A slanted lettering style is often requested by aircraft owners. These templates are then used. The templates are taped in place, traced, and then masked off. Tight radiuses are masked using eighth inch wide masking tape. Let's go back to the T-34 where we are now ready for part nine, spraying colors. At Central Aviation, most of the colors are mixed at the time needed by the staff. The microfiche machine on the left has a current file of 2,800 colors. The proper mixture is determined by specified weights of the three primary colors, red, blue, yellow. The can is thoroughly mixed by this paint mixer. The gun cup is loaded by straining the paint with a standard paper paint strainer. The first color sprayed will be the red on the stars and bars. Each color will receive three even coats. Proper drying time is required between each coat. The paint should be tacky to the touch. Do not try to cover the white base color in only one or two coats.
The red area is covered with a paper tent so the overspray from the next color won't cause any problems. Note, the paper will not touch the still tacky paint. The nose is wiped down with a tack cloth and is ready for the first of three coats of a somewhat flat black. The owner did not wish to have a true flat black as the original navy planes do. Once again, three even coats will be applied. The back side of the prop is also sprayed black. Notice Gene is now back to a cup on the spray gun rather than the pressure pot. The area behind the canopy is also sprayed with the flat black. The third coat is applied and let dry. Next, Dennis starts wet sanding the red overspray areas. It is critical not to hit the edge of the masking tape while sanding. This obviously will cause uneven edges and possible paint bleeds. Blue is up next with three even layers applied. Note the red bars are covered with paper. The spray areas are checked in between coats. If the paint is sticky and stringy when touched, it is too wet. The surface should be tacky, but not entirely dry. Do not start the next coat until the surface is ready. With the flat black areas dried and masked off, International Orange is next. The nose, wingtips, and vertical fin are also sprayed.
orange accent stripe on the prop is also sprayed. Wing tips and elevators are also painted orange. The screws which hold the wing tips and other cowl fittings are mounted on cardboard and sprayed. Again, three coats of international orange will be sprayed. The numbers which will match standard Navy aircraft are applied in the same manner as shown earlier on the Citabria. All surrounding areas have been masked off. Gene starts spraying with the large Navy lettering on the bottom side of the wing. Only two coats of this gloss black paint will be applied. Notice the FAA required N number below the horizontal stabilizer. The second coat sprayed on the numbers marks the end of the spraying process. Fabric-covered aircraft still have an important role in the sport aviation area. Long-lasting, durable, and flexible finishes are the guidelines used when selecting one of the several types of covering systems available to the builder. At the end of this video, a list of fabric covering manufacturers can be found. Consult the recommendations of the kit manufacturer if this applies to you. Let's look at one very popular covering system the Stitz Polyfiber Covering System. After the polyester fabric has been glued on and heat shrunk to the proper tension, a coating of a brushed on sealer is applied. Once dry, the wing receives a sprayed on coat of poly spray and aluminum pigment spray to block ultraviolet radiation and fill the fabric weave. 
After three coats with wet sanding between the coats, the wing is ready for the base coat of Polytone, a flexible aircraft finish. After the paint is dried, a pigmented color strip is masked off and sprayed. A video with step-by-step -step instructions is available from Stitz Aircraft or the EAA Aviation Foundation. The use of composite materials in airplanes is quickly becoming a major building technique for today's sport and business aircraft. At the end of this video is a list of suppliers and manufacturers to assist you if painting of a composite is required. Some cautions include, number one, never use paint stripper because the active agents may attack the resins and soften or distort the surface. Do not paint accent stripes spanwise over airfoils because the stripe can reduce lift and increase drag dramatically. Always use a paint with adequate ultraviolet protection. The sun's rays can do great damage to the foams in composites. After the aircraft is cleaned up and checked for any paint leaks or bleeds, reassembling is next and at last a great looking bird rolls out of the hangar. The plane hasn't looked this good since it was built. With great care, the plane can maintain this brand new appearance and also be protected from the elements. Well, you see what it takes to refinish a metal aircraft properly. It's a great deal of work and it's dirty work. So take your time, use high quality supplies, and above all, take the necessary safety precautions. Good luck.